and welcome to the 39th Western Washington University Athletics Hall of Fame induction ceremony. As I always point out, Western's Hall of Fame is the oldest among all Pacific Northwest colleges and universities, with the first induction ceremony taking place in 1968. And here they are, Carver Gym, halftime, 1968. Anybody want to guess? Bill Who's Norm this? Hash. Norm Hash. Bill Wright. Bill Wright. Norm Dahl. Norm Dahl. Bob Tisdale. Gene Stays. Chuck Erickson. And Dick Carver standing in for Sam Carver. Yeah, that's who they are. I'd like to be, uh, begin today introducing Western um, athletic staff and coaches. This has been an interesting year for Western Athletics. It has made the, made the transition in leadership. About a year ago, Linda Goodrich announced her retirement after 27 years as Director of Athletics. Steve Card was made the Interim Director, and after an exhaustive nationwide search that took 10 months to complete, it was verified that the best of the best was already in that chair, and on March 25th, it was announced that Steve Card would be the sixth AD in school history. Congratulations, Steve. <laughs> Steve had been our Athletics Associate Director for Business and Financial Affairs for 23 years and had coached the men's uh, golf team for 20 seasons, directing them to 12 national appearances, and he coached 27 All-Americans. So he, he knows it from eat every which way that has to happen. Steve will be happy to hear some news that will be announced Monday that you're going to hear today. That announcement is that Western has won its sixth straight Great Northwest Athletic Conference all sports title for 2013-14 and its 10th in the 13 year history of the conference. The Vikings also won, and that, this is what Steve really wants to hear, the Vikings also won the GNAC men's all-sports title for the sixth consecutive year and the 11th time overall, and the women's all-sports title for the fifth straight year and the eighth overall. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Today we honor the Western Athletics Hall of Fame class of 2014. They include an athlete of the century, a legend from the land down under, and Western's most talented brother combination. They are softball center fielder Jan, Jen Brandolini Register, who helped the Vikings to the school's first team national title in 1998. Men's basketball guard Ron Radliff, who gained fame for his uh, three-point shooting as a professional player in Australia. And brothers Jacob and Jared Stevenson, who combined to score 3,048 points for the Vikings in men's basketball. With the addition of today's inductees, the membership of Western's Hall of Fame increases to 129. When you consider that athletics began around 1902 at then Wacom State Normal School, you see how exclusive this group is. Where's my, do you have that ready to go? We gotta get into the mood here. We need some mood music. <laughs> Just play a few of that. Okay. Okay. Little Australian feel to the theme, to the uh, morning. Our first inductee today is Ron Radliff, who who competed at Western from 1976 to 1980. Ron played 10 seasons professionally in, Aust in Australia's National Basketball League, seven with the Brisbane Bullets, and three with the Gold Coast Rollers. Um, Ralph, he um, you know, my glasses are kind of weird with this thing anyway. Not that that would help much anyway. Uh, Ron helped Brisbane win NBL championships with, uh, in 1985 and 1987 as a player, and another in 2007 as an assistant coach. Known as Ron the Rat, and 
Ron the Rap t-shirts right here. <laughs> this one is going to be very valuable. I know in a few years I'm going to put it on eBay, so be ready. <laughs> long hair and long range shooter. Uh, he finished his legendary career with 3,759 points, 1,034 assists, shot 43.5% from three-point range. The three-point shot was introduced uh, during the second season there, which was a very nice thing to have happen. And he shot 83.2% at the free-throw line. In all, Ron played and coached in over 900 games in the Australian NBL, and his jersey number 22 was retired by both Brisbane and Gold Coast. Ron earned NEIA District 1 honorable mention and was the Western team MVP as a senior in 79-80. He averaged 13.2 points as six man that season, setting a school record by shooting 91.1% at the free throw line. And we kind of got it figured out that he was a good free throw shooter. Ron was a four year letter winner for the Vikings. At Enumclaw, where he was coached by his dad, Ron scored 1,015 career points and played in the senior All-State game. Ron has spent the last 31 years in Australia. He and wife Sue have two growing sons, Joshua 26 and Jordan 22. Ron's, Ron's presenter is his father, Gary Radliff. Gary, if you can start up this way, that'd be great. Oh, he's right here. Actually, you're fine. Gary is a Western graduate also and lettered four years in basketball for the Vikings also in the mid-50s. Gary was the head basketball coach for 25 years at Enumclaw High School, the same school he attended during his school days, his high school days. Gary's Enumclaw teams won six league titles, made 10 district tournament appearances, uh, winning two titles, and made six state tournament appearances, places, placing fifth, or five, uh, we'll get it back here, placing in five of them. Gary was the state nominee for the national Basketball Coach of the Year in 1986 and is a Washington Interclastic Basketball Coaches Association Hall of Fame inductee. Gary Radliff. Thank you. That was very nice. I didn't know all that stuff. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, just a pleasure to be here as, as well as uh, introduce my son who is a Hall of Famer uh, which is uh, something that not, uh, a lot of fathers don't get to do uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to do that today. I'd like to congratulate all the Hall of Famers. That's a, uh, actually a tremendous achievement for uh, uh, them to get to this point. Uh, and also their folks for allowing this to happen. There could have been a lot of other things go on that uh, these kids never, never would have made. Kids, I'm saying. Uh, my son is 57 coming up. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I think that it's a tremendous achievement and this is a great uh, deal to have. It's great to be back at Western. It's been a long time since I've been up here. Uh, just to give you a little background on Ron, um, he was born in Bellingham, so it's only fitting that he come back here for the award. He, he actually uh, was three weeks late. He, uh, I guess, just wasn't ready to get here, so he uh, stayed with, uh, our, my wife stayed with uh, Les and Elaine Knudsen, and uh, three weeks later, Ron arrived. So anyway, uh, from this point, uh, point he, he uh, I guess he just took his time about a lot of things. Uh, from Friday Harbor we went we came to Enumclaw. Ron was a uh, he won an old Woody contest there if you've ever heard about that. I thought I was going to have an all-star pitcher and uh, uh, nothing happened with that. He turned all his attention to uh, basketball. He uh, played in three state tournaments. Uh, it's pretty good for a high school kid. And he was all-conference two years. He was the MVP one year. Uh, he made all-state one year, his senior year, and he was a boy of the year in Enumclaw High School for one year, which I thought was pretty good action for a kid coming from uh, Friday Harbor. Uh, 
he uh, at the end of his junior year he did take a trip to Australia uh, Ed Peppel took a group of uh, high school kids to Australia so he had a little bit of contact um, in that time with Australia <coughs> he played for Chuck Randall here at uh, Western and um, there was a I, I didn't get a lot of our schedules conflicted so I, I didn't get up to see him as much as uh, I would have liked to have been able to see him but uh, I think it's guy, a fellow named Scott Stansberry wrote that um, they should call him Pyro because he lights a fire under all the other players and I thought that would have been a better title than Ron the Rat. I wasn't quite sure about this <laughs> Ron the Rat. It seemed like when I was uh, coaching that, uh, you know, any time I lost a game, it had in the paper Coach Ratliff, his team lost. And I never did like, I thought they did that on purpose rather than uh, Ratliff. Uh, but anyway, this is a name that has stuck with him. And uh, these shirts, uh, I had a flock of these shirts. I give them away at home. But uh, the other day I went to the... Uh, hospital there was a, a girl there uh, and I happened to have a Ron the Rat shirt on I just didn't have another shirt to wear and uh, uh, so this girl asked me oh you're, you're uh, she says Mr. Radliff I said yeah the ex-student I said well who are you she says oh I was in love with your son and I said oh that's interesting I've got his t-shirt on right now she says oh I'd love to have it and so I went in the back room, Shane took my shirt off and gave her my t-shirt. My daughter on, the, on the, some internet thing picked this up. She put it on some, took a picture of it and then put it on this internet thing. And so she calls me and says, Dad, what's going on here? I said, uh, well, she just asked me for a shirt. She said, everybody's telling me you're giving your shirts away and everything. She was worried about me. <laughs> anyway... Uh, he, uh, from Western, he went to Australia. He played for the Brisbane Bullets, and uh, at that time, uh, I thought, holy smokes. You know, he said, yeah, I'll go anywhere and play basketball, but I, I certainly didn't feel like I wanted him to go away. Uh, but uh, uh, we uh, let him go, and, and uh, he just had had a marvelous career. Uh, and it was like a big family. Uh, we were included in all of their activities when we went over, and, uh, and it was uh, pretty exciting. And then when they made the three-point uh, uh, play, it wasn't that we didn't have it in high school, or these guys would have scored a lot more points, but um, they put it in over there, and all he did is sit out and shoot three points. I thought, shoot, he's lost all the other effectiveness that he has. He's a great ball handler, a great passer, but he'd go down the corner and they'd throw him the ball and he'd shoot, you know. And so it changed uh, the whole... Uh, Coach Randall would have been nuts with that kind of an offense. <laughs> anyway, he uh, uh, thrived on that. And uh, another thing that was really great over there is that uh, the seasons were different times. And so the, uh, when us, the Bris uh, Brisbane Bulls would finish their season, it was just starting over here in the U.S. Uh, their basketball was just starting up. So uh, he had all kinds of tours coming to the U.S. And so uh, actually he got to see a lot of places that he never got to see well, when he lived here. But anyway, uh, it was a good thing for us because I would go back and, and catch these tours and go around with him and watch him play the, the big colleges. They played Duke. And they played a lot of big-time schools and and they usually fared fairly well, except toward the end of their stay. And by that time, they, they I don't know what, they were, they were so tired, they uh, didn't do as well. Uh, he's back in the United States now. He, uh, he and his wife moved over here, which is a big deal, really. I never thought, I just thought, you know, it's just like moving from Puyallup to Enoclon, which Ron Crow probably would never do. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Lancaster was my assistant for uh, 25 years at Enumclaw, and Frank always told me he was the pride of the valley. And so I asked Buster Burlett once, and I said, is it true that uh, Frank Lancaster is the pride of the valley in Puyallup? Because there's Ron Crow and all these great athletes in Puyallup. And he said, if Frank Lancaster said it, it must be true. 
You know, one time, uh, Ron, too, uh, maybe I'll give you a little story here. He, uh, uh, they traveled a lot. They, you know, the, Australia's a big continent, so everywhere they had to play, they'd fly to Perth or all over the United States, or all over Australia. Well, Ron always got, um, uh, when they doled out the rooms, he roomed with uh, Larry Senstock, who was an Olympian, and uh, uh, Robert Sibley, who was a pretty good player too. He'd get up to the front and get his keys, and he'd go up to the bedroom where there was three beds in there, and there was two little ones and one big one. Well, he'd always take his clothes off and jump into the big bed, and then when the, when the big guys come up and looked at this, no way would they get in that bed. They took the little beds, and he had the big one. Anyway, uh, He's back here, and what better way to start than coming back and come back and be in your college uh, hall of fame? And uh, so I, he's kind of, he actually left as a, a little little kid and came back as a natural national hero over there. He uh, uh, almost was a cult type of thing. I, I was always worried about that, but uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, he came back as a, na a national hero, and uh, I'd like to introduce him, Ron Radliff, my son. Thank you. Uh, it's not every day you get inducted into a Hall of Fame or anything, but it's probably not every day you get introduced by your father, and I think that was very cool, very nice. So thanks very much, Dad, for doing that. That was good. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Paul called me up to come up and get in and in, in, inducted into the Hall of Fame, and uh, I couldn't think of anything else to say, but yes, I, <laughs> I was very surprised, and because um, really I almost didn't come to Western. I uh, I had other choices to go to, and uh, Central Washington was probably a very good choice probably for me to go to basketball and um, Coach Nicholson doesn't usually recruit freshmen and uh, he was he was after me a little bit but I came up here my mother suggested I come up here my mother and father both went to school up here and uh, I was born up here so my mother suggested I come up to Western and I really didn't know that much about Western basketball I hadn't really followed I knew more about Linden, Linden Christian, Nooksack Valley, Blaine I knew all their about their basketball. I go and watch the A tournament every year, so I knew all about that. So I came up here and uh, talked to Coach Randall, and uh, Coach Randall sort of told me that I've already recruited two guards that are better than you, and uh, <laughs> and uh, we've got this guy coming back, and we've got that guy coming back, and because uh, I don't really want to discourage you from coming here, but uh, I appreciated his his truthfulness, but uh, I just sort of thought that. Uh, I didn't mind a good challenge, so this would be a good challenge. And I also felt that if he's got somebody up here that knows the game as well as I do, understands the game as well as I do, who works at their game as hard as I did, and who loves to play the game as much as I did, I wouldn't mind playing behind somebody like that. So uh, I wasn't too worried. I, I, I thought I could play up here. And I remember the first week up here, we have the... We went up to the old gym up in the back gym, and all the freshmen got up there pretty early because it was the first day of scrimmages. And uh, I remember I got on the team with Kevin Bryant, Scott Smith, Mylon Tanzer, and uh, Doug Creasy. We we're all freshmen, and we started playing, and uh, we we started winning. We'd play we'd play the seven games, full court games of seven. We won, and uh, pretty soon the older guys started to get there, and they'd just kind of come up jokingly and play, and we'd beat them, and. Coach Randall came up and was sitting in the back of the stands, so all these guys started to get a little bit serious, and they started making the, their own teams and uh, coming out there and beating us up a little bit. But we won every single game, and I, I knew from right then that I, I can play here. I can, I, I'm not going to have any trouble playing up here. I just had to be patient and wait my shot, and uh, and I got my chance to play. So every year it seemed like the four years went by very quickly here. Um, Somebody sort of asked me, do you remember, what, what was a game that you really remember? And honestly, there was never a game that really sticks out in my mind. Um, I don't really remember me coming out there and destroying, making a lot of shots, doing this, doing that. So, uh, But I remember 
going to practice. I enjoyed going to practice every day. The, my teammates, I had great teammates here every year. There's a few different ones, but there were some great teammates here. We always had fun. And every team that came up here to play us had to play hard. We played hard, and uh, we beat a lot of good teams. But we lost some games that probably, probably shouldn't have lost, too. But we never had that great season. We never... We always seem to drive over to Central every year, go to Ellensburg and lose that last game and have to drive all the way back home again. But uh, I had fun. I enjoyed it here. And uh, it, was, it was a great four seasons. It just went too quickly. So the next year, um, I came and played again uh, for Watkin Furcrest. And Rick Harden, who was a Bellingham boy, was the coach of the, the Watkin Furcrest. And uh, he went to Australia the next year after that season. His sister lived there, I think. And he became the director of basketball coaching in Queensland, and he became the head coach at um, the Brisbane Bullets, which is in the National League. And he told me that uh, if you wanted to come over and play, I'd get you onto a club team. And I just kind of said, nah, I don't want to play for a club team. If you need somebody for the National League, I'll come do that. And uh, so a lot of my friends were going over there. A lot of guys, Bobby Nickel went over there, Bruce Brevard went over there, uh, Rob Scheibner, Dan Birch, Eric Erickson, as a few guys, all went over there and played in the club teams. I'm starting to think, well, I should have said, oh, I should go play for a club team. But I held out, and it was over a year later that Rick called me up and said, well, I got an opening. Do you want to come chance? And I said, yeah, when do you want me there? So I went over there and... Uh, December, I think it was December 12th, 1982, and it was so hot. It was the hottest place in the world, I thought, very humid, and uh, the basketball stadium was a little tin shed, pretty much. We went there, and um, so my first year there, our games were on a Sunday afternoon, 2.30 on a Sunday afternoon, and uh, the basketball stadium was just around the corner from the pub, and... Uh, so we'd only get about two, 300 people to the game. And by the second half, there was probably about 100 people there because everyone was just kind of buying their time to go to the pub. The pub was probably a bit more important than the basketball at that time. <laughs> so, um, but our first year there, we, we, we played okay. Uh, we didn't make the playoffs, so I figured I'm gone. I mean, the first thing that happens to the Americans' imports that come over here, you don't make the playoffs, you usually go. So uh, I kind of took off and went around different places just to see as much as Australia as I could before they shipped me out because they had my ticket to go home. And so I stayed away from them, didn't give them my phone number, and didn't want them to find me. Um, so what happened was that Rick got fired, and they brought in a new coach. And the new coach they brought in just happened to be the coach that I had my best game against the year before. and. Uh, so he signed me up, and, he, and the next thing that happened was he signed me up with probably one of the best Americans that ever came over to play there. So that took the pressure off me and uh, made our team a lot better. But this coach that came in really made us work, turn, turn things, made it professional. You came to practice, you worked hard. If you didn't come to practice, you weren't going to play. And, and that's what had happened in the past. It was a very lazy sort of, uh, and this, he turned it professional. But he also turned it into... He promoted the game. He really pushed the game of basketball. And the game of basketball really wasn't that popular. The first year I was there in Australia, I think we had one or two articles in the back, the very back of the newspaper. So not too many people really knew about it. So he really promoted our games. We came on Friday and Saturday night. Each season, we kind of moved to a different stadium. So from my first five years there, we went from playing in front of 200 people to uh, a stadium that held 14,000. We were getting over 10,000 a game. So it was just overnight. We were in the newspapers, we were on TV, we were in the radio, we were just, <coughs> if there was an opening of something, and they used to say if there was an opening of an envelope, we'd be there. Um, we, were at a, we were at the nightclubs, we were at the shopping centers, we were at schools. We were just, everything we did was to promote the game of basketball. and. Pretty soon, those 10,000 people were there every game, and uh, after each game, they was all out there waiting for an autograph. You just couldn't, it was, it really reminded me of when I was a kid who used to go watch the Sonics, and we used to stand outside the Sonic dressing room just to watch the players go by or get, try to get an autograph from them, and, and this was sort of what was happening to me that was, it was pretty amazing, actually, and uh, they had t-shirts, they had good old t-shirts, and, um, we had posters of ourselves, and 
we were really became household names because in those next four years I played there, we made the finals each of the four years. And uh, we won two of them and lost to them. And, that, and a basket here, a basket there, we would have won four titles in the, in the, the thing. But it was live television. It was just, just, I don't know, everyone knew it. I remember once I was over here with my family at Disneyland and um, the kids, pushing the kids around in the stroller and over in a, in a shop there, at a gift shop. And these people kept looking at me and I'm thinking, oh God, what did I do? And uh, they kept looking. The kids finally came over and said, oh, can we have your autograph? We're from Melbourne, Australia. And I thought, oh, geez. And so I'm in, the, in this place, get my picture taken with these kids and autographs. And all these other people are looking at me, trying to figure out if I'm somebody important or not. <laughs> and, uh, but in Australia, it was just, we were household names. Everyone knew who we were. And we, you'd go out to dinner, and they said, oh, that's all right. We'll pay for it. Well, can you wear these clothes? Can you do this? Can you do that? It was, it was amazing. It was just something that you, you wouldn't imagine. But it was just that sort of period of time where basketball just blew up. It was, it was amazing. And also what really happened probably that saved me my second year was the three-point line came in. And uh, the first year I played, I averaged about 14 points a game and things like that. And I just sort of played. And then this three-point line came in and uh, it was where I shot from. And so I'm getting three or four extra points a game just shooting from where I always shot from. And uh, I thought whoever put that three-point line in was a really good guy. <laughs> So I averaged over 20 some points a game my second year there and it was just, it just happened. It wasn't like a lot of these guys now they have to look and see where the three, I just shot and got an extra point. Um, especially when I got older and got slower, all I had to do was run from three point line to three point line. And, uh, and uh, I had a sort of had a knack for knowing when to shoot it. I, I hit a, probably the majority of my three points came down in the fourth quarter when we really needed the, I whack whack hit a couple of threes and all of a sudden the game's over. And uh, the other teams didn't really like that that much. But um, the Australian people loved the three pointer. It was amazing that they used to like the dunk. I mean, I, the first thing they asked me, can you dunk? No, I can't even come close to dunking. And so, uh, the three-point all of a sudden came in. The announcers just love the three-point went in, and they, that was their biggest call was the three-pointer. And I could go one for eight, one for ten, and after that game, people would come, oh, that was a great shot you made, that three-point shot. How did I, I missed eight other ones. And they only remembered the one. So uh, that really helped my career out, and I, I, I really wish they hadn't brought the three-point line in for the the younger people, just let it go for the professional people because um, it's something that all the kids now are out there throwing up three-pointers and that wrecks their shooting style and everything like that. But that was a great thing for me. Um, the uh, Those five seasons where I had there in Brisbane making the finals, um, we won the final in 80. 87 was sort of a huge year for me personally because I got married had my first son. The amazing thing was, to, to, yeah, I, my son's born in December, and these people want to, want to take my picture, want to get it in a magazine. Want to, I mean, I was one of the first players on our team, um, championship team, that had a, had a son. And uh, they really wanted, so I kept saying, no, no, no. Finally, I, they, said, they came over, and they took the pictures, me and my son. So I go down to the newspaper, go down to the shop and buy a newspaper, and there we are on the front page of the newspaper. And I mean, I couldn't even get on the back page when the first year, and then all of a sudden, here's me and my son on the front page. It was a very slow news day, obviously, but <laughs> still having our picture on the front of the, I mean, and that's like, it was like having my picture on the front of the Seattle Times. I mean, everyone knew who I was, and now they knew I had a son, and it was pretty amazing. We, and after we won the title that year, they had a parade through the city for us too, like a ticker tape parade. It was, and Brisbane was about the size of Portland, sort of by the river, same sort of thing. And it, there was people everywhere. It was just something you don't, I never thought would happen. So it was great. So I played about seven seasons with Brisbane and then the league expanded and uh, they moved a team down to the Gold Coast, which is about an hour south of Brisbane. And the Gold Coast to me is sort of like the Hawaii of Australia. It was 
all the high rises, all the great beaches, all the the um, the theme parks, just everything. Everyone would save up all year and, and go to their vacations on the Gold Coast. So here I'm going to go play for them. That's I love the beach, and uh, so I went down there and played. And three years there was was just as good, or probably even better. They had a basketball show. I'm on a basketball show. I write an article for a newspaper. It just I just kept doing, saying, yep, yep, I'll do that. And then, uh, so I played 10 years. 10 years in Australia was just, it was a bonus to me to play basketball outside of, after finishing at Western, 10 more years was amazing. And I was very thankful for that. And uh, my body was very thankful I retired. So that, <laughs> that next year I, I felt great. But I went straight from playing basketball to coaching basketball. So I stepped right into, and with that, just, I mean, more and more things happened, and uh, I was traveling over here watching the CBA games, going to NBA camps, talking to scouts, um, just traveling all around watching basketball, recruiting players, uh, just, it was, it was amazing sort of life I was leading there, and um, so after that, coaching and traveling and just doing all those different things, uh, my life just flew by. I got married, I got two sons, and I'm thinking, wow, I mean, I've been in Australia longer than I've been over here. And I just, I never really figured that I could spend that much time. I went to Australia for one year, one season, to see what would happen. And uh, 31 years later, all this has happened to me, and uh, I just sort of thought, it's time to go home. I haven't been home for a long time. and. Uh, my wife, who had a very good career in hotel management, decided, yeah, let's go. My son, my, my oldest son is a, lives and works in Alaska, works for a television station as an executive producer in Alaska. My youngest son decided he's going to stay in Australia. He, he's going to school there. He loves Australia. And uh, he surfs. He, he does everything in Australia. He's an Australian. It's, 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 our family's mixed up. but. Uh, <laughs> They're half Australian, half American, but it was time for me to come home, and uh, I just thought, let's come home and see what happens here, and then uh, I'm here for a couple of weeks, and Paul calls me up, and I don't know how he found me, but he calls me up and says, would you like to be inducted to the Hall of Fame? And I, I said, sure, yeah, no problem, I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a surprising thing to me, and it was an exciting thing to me. I, I mean, Western holds a lot of good memories. Bellingham holds a lot of good memories. So I'm honestly very proud to be inducted into this, and I'm very thankful. So, Paul, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, people. Thank you. Our second and um, third inductees are the Stevenson brothers, Jared and Jacob. They have a combined total of nearly 10,000 points when you consider high school, college, and professional teams. But if you added in all the other games that they played in their lives, I'm sure it'd be close to 10,000. But um, we'll begin with Jacob. Jacob finished his four-year Western career in 2003 with 1,320 points, 403 assists, and 165 steals. He helped the Vikings to their first West Regional title and Elite Eight appearance. Quite an accomplishment. Being named the Regional Most Outstanding Player in 2001 as he averaged 22.5 points in four national tournament games. Jacob was a first-team Pacific West Conference West Division All-Star and Little All Northwest as a junior that season, averaging a team leading 16.1 points. It was interesting that team, I think it was the first one in Western history that had four players that averaged 14 or more points. Uh, Jacob received Street and Smith's preseason All-America honorable mention as a senior. Uh, he led the Vikings in assists three years, led her four years. Currently, Jacob is in his ninth season with the Bellingham Slam helping the team to three IBL titles. Prior to the season, he had career totals of 3,710 points, 10, uh, 1,038 rebounds, 
796 assists, 375 steals, and 183 games. In 2013, Jacob, a 14-time league all-star, was named 2013 IBL Player of the Year by usbasket.com. As a senior at Seum High School, Jacob was a second-team All-State pick, averaging 18 points and five assists as a senior on a team that placed third at the 1998 Class 4A State Tournament. Jacob's presenter is Brad Jackson. Brad just completed his second season as a top assistant coach at the University of Washington. Prior to that, he was the head men's basketball coach at Western for 27 seasons. Brad directed the Vikings to the 2012 NCAA Division II National Championship and left Western as the winningest coach in program history with 518 victories and was the 2012 National NABC and Division and Division II Bulletin uh, National Coach of the Year. In all, Brad directed Western to 19 national postseason appearances. He is one of just five four-year collegiate men's coaches in the state of Washington to win 500 games. The others are Marv Harshman, Dean Nicholson, Heck Edmondson, and Leo Nicholson. Pretty good company. Brad Jackson. Well, good morning, everyone. Special morning, and I'm very privileged to be here this morning. First of all, I'd like to thank Paul Madison for all of his hard work and his staff in putting this together. I know that Paul works diligently on this and has for a number of years, and uh, Paul, thank you very much for all that you do. Um, secondly, I would like to congratulate all of the inductees. Uh, what a privilege it is, and uh, it's just a great opportunity to reflect on your accomplishments and wonderful to hear uh, about your lives and the impact that your participation in athletics here at Western uh, had for you as well and certainly for all of us. Um, also, I want to recognize Lou and Linda Stevenson because um, just being in Bellingham and watching Jared and Jacob grow up and watching the commitment level of their parents, uh, sorry, over many years, uh, what a thrill as a parent to have two children, excuse me, really didn't mean to get emotional here, but uh, uh, at any rate, uh, Lou and Linda, just uh, what, a, what a neat deal. And uh, gosh. Um, and so I just want to uh, congratulate them because uh, they're, um, I went to a lot of games through the years watching, watching the boys play. And uh, very, very rarely would you ever go to a game and not see Lou and Linda there. And I know the, the support level and the love for the game of basketball that, that came from them is really significant. So congratulations to both of you. Okay, do a little better now here. Also, I'd like to recognize Pat Fitter. Uh, Pat um, coached both Jared and Jacob, one of the greatest high school coaches ever in the state of Washington, I'd have to say, uh, in the country. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to coach for many, many years, observed a lot of coaches. Uh, and I think Pat is certainly one of the best ever. And uh, I think both Jared and Jacob and any of you guys uh, that are in this room would certainly uh, echo those thoughts in having had an opportunity to play for Pat. So Pat, thanks a lot for being here also. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, um, first got to know Jake when he was just a little guy growing up over on Bayside. And uh, it was kind of a unique environment uh, Stevenson's live right across from the Harvey boys across the street and uh, it was uh, really interesting watching all these guys grow up they love to do a lot of stuff um, sometimes gotten a little mischief but uh, they were uh, great kids um, it was actually we used to joke all the time in our family because they actually had their own language we called it the Bayside dialect 
And uh, they had these little words. They had little things that they said. It was almost like living in a different country. But if you ever picked up the phone with Robert Harvey on one end or Jared or Jake or Michael or any of these guys, um, they, they did. They had their own little words and their own little language. And it was, uh, it was very fun to, to watch and to listen to and, and to watch these kids grow up. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, I think with Jacob, you know, Paul read the stats, you can read the stats, and, and I really don't want to talk about that right now because those speak for themselves and uh, has kind of put him in a class of basketball players, particularly in the Northwest, that I think a lot of people don't really realize his accomplishments, but they are significant. Um, but I think that the things that stick out to me, uh, there's a few things that um, I feel are certainly as important as the things that actually happen on the floor as it relates to the statistical part of the game. One of those is that those, in my experience coaching Jacob in college, um, one of the neatest things was his, his teammates loved him. Jake was a tremendous player, but he was one of those guys that always brought out the best in his teammates. And, <clears throat> excuse me, he, um, he, he, I don't think he really thought he was doing that necessarily, but it was just the way that he was. And it came about because of a couple of things. One was his love for the game. And any coach will tell you that if you can get a player that comes every day, that loves to play, and that's going to give his best effort, that is really all you can ask. And I can honestly say that I can never remember a day um, in my experience coaching Jacob that he came to a game of practice not wanting to play. In fact, just the opposite. And that was very evident to his teammates, rubbed off on his teammates, and I think it made our team much, much better. Um, the other thing that, that I would say is that Jacob loves the game. And, you know, I watched him play, um, still like to watch him play uh, for years and years and years, but that was also one of those things that stuck out. It was just so evident, um, his love for the game. And I think consequently, um, through his life, he got better and better and better and better. And as I mentioned, he played in a great high school program, had a lot of accomplishments in high school. But every year that he competed, uh, he continued to get better. And, you know, it was a few years ago, I was watching one of the slam games and watching Jake play. And it, it struck me that, boy, you know, he's still getting better. Um, and the last thing I guess I'd like to say about Jake in terms of that whole deal is that, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the most gratifying things to me about being a coach um, is uh, when people come up and say, boy, you guys are really fun to watch. Um, that always meant a lot to me, and that was one of my goals certainly here when I was the head coach here. Um, but, but that has always been something that for me, and I would guess for many of you, when I watch Jacob Stevenson play ball, I go, boy, that guy's fun to watch. Um, Jake, Jake's one of the, excuse me, um, Jake's one of the toughest kids I've ever met, but he's always done it with a smile on his face. Sorry. Um, lastly, one of the greatest things about athletics to me is that athletics give you an opportunity to test your heart. Jacob's got a great heart. Jake, congratulations. I was expecting him to pull that speech out of his sock, though, so that was his classic uh, move out there on the court, crumpling it up. And 
But thank you, Brad. Appreciate all your kind words. Um, this is truly an honor to be up here today. <laughs> and uh, I didn't think I was going to get emotional, but uh, <laughs> blaming it on Brad. <laughs> I guess I should pull out my words I had prepared. Um, really, I just have a lot of people to thank. Um, uh, but uh, I'd like to thank my uncle, Larry, and uh, God, <laughs> Kylie for coming up from Reno. Really appreciate that. Um, I'd like to thank all my friends, family, and supporters here today. Um, it's a huge honor to be inducted into the Hall of Fame today and uh, be here along with Jen, Ron, and Jared. Um, basketball has been a huge part of my life and I uh, have a ton, ton of great memories. Um, and I couldn't be here without the support of my teammates, coaches, friends, and uh, most importantly, my uh, parents. Um, looking out here, I have a lot of good friends here. It's nice to see you guys and thanks for coming. Um, coaches. Um, coach Chuck Randall up here in front wasn't a coach, but he was sure always on me and giving me advice and and uh, always telling me how good I could be and I really appreciate that, Coach. Um, I, my parents. Um, they've, they've been amazing and uh, I can't thank you guys enough. Um, like Brad said, they, I don't think they ever missed a game that was in the state of Washington. Um, they were always there and uh, just done so much for their kids and uh, I can't thank you guys enough for uh, everything you've done. Um, it's, it's been really awesome and the sport's been amazing. Um, so after I talking with Paul um, about getting inducted, it was, it, was, um, it was a surprise, but it was really kind of a cool deal to look back, you know, just kind of growing up and playing basketball and how I got here and uh, just the different coaches and circumstances that allowed me to, to get here. Um, starting from playing AAU, I had some good coaches um, with Steve Miller and Steve Totten. Um, they really had a passion for the game. They're kind of some funny, funny individuals, some characters, and uh, they really helped uh, put that passion in me for the uh, for basketball. Um, my dad was also a, a great coach and coached me a lot, and uh, actually continued to coach me through college. Um, so that was that was nice to have that, um, and then. You know, going to Sea Home was, I, I feel really grateful to be able to go to Sea Home and play for Coach Pat Fetter. Um, arguably the best coach in, in the state of Washington and, and uh, just really lucky to be able to go up there and, and have him push me and, and he really got the best out of people and uh, I really appreciate that. Um, I, looking back, I was kind of brings back a lot of memories and I was thinking of <laughs> one of the uh, first times that uh, Fit really got upset with me and uh, it was in PE class and I don't know if he remembers it but uh, we were just playing and you know it wasn't a real competitive game and so I was kind of goofing off I was a little bored with it I think and uh, <laughs> so we were on a fast break and somebody threw a, a full court pass and I was on the baseline and I don't know why, but I, for some reason, felt that it was Pele or something, and let the ball go over my head and kind of kicked the ball on the back of my heel, and perfect pass to the guy under the hoop. And I, I thought I was pretty, pretty special, and pretty cool. <laughs> start running back, and I look up and I see Pat <laughs> walking towards me, and just red. And I was like, oh crap. <laughs> and, uh, he took me aside and just 
reamed into me. I mean, I think he took me up to his office, and I mean, he was talking about calling my dad and <laughs> all this stuff. And I was like, man, I mean, that, that was fit. He really took it serious, and didn't matter what you're doing, he wanted you to, to be your best. And uh, I'm just hoping today, if he does remember that, he uh, realizes how uh, excellent of a pass that was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I could do it again if I try. Uh, I'm at least still impressed. Um, so thanks a lot, Coach. Appreciate it. Um, and then coming up to Western, um, I kind of asked for a better situation. I would thank Coach Jackson and Tony for bringing me up here. Um, Coach Jackson's been, like like he said, I've known him for a long time. Um, so, you know, growing up, it's not like I ever really thought that I'd ever be playing up here. I, you know, it kind of seemed above me or where I could I could get, um, just being a little kid, you know, idolizing a lot of the Western players growing up. So uh, it was nice knowing Brad, and I remember a um, good friend, Robert and teammate, uh, we'd always come up here and play basketball in middle school, and uh, we had a couple basketballs stolen from us throughout the years, and I think Brad got word of it, um, and he actually got us a locker in the men's locker room. And so I remember being in there, and we kind of thought we were pretty cool, you know, being in the men's locker room, and all these Western basketball players in there that we had idolized, and uh, so it was pretty cool. Six years later, you know, to come up here and have Brad give me a locker because um, I had earned a spot on the team. So I really appreciate everything Brad did for me. And that's just kind of the person, you know, that's, he was a good friend, good person, and, and a great coach. And uh, really appreciate you bringing me up here and, and all you did for us. So thank you. Um, and also there's Coach D. Um, you know, being an assistant coach, um, you're doing a lot of things behind the scenes, and uh, you don't always get a lot of credit, but Coach D, uh, you really did a lot for us, and I, I appreciate everything you did for us. And uh, also, I'd like to congratulate on, on your success you've had up here as the, the head coach. Um, it's pretty neat to see. <clears throat> um, and then, uh, being able to play for the Bellingham Slam has been, been pretty neat. Um, I didn't really play competitively for um, uh, maybe three years after college. So when that started up, it's pretty exciting um, for that to happen. And there's there's a lot of people that that uh, spent a lot of time and effort to get the Bellingham Slam going. Um, and once again, Tony was uh, kind of the guy that started it and, and made that all happen. And uh, there's another guy, Tony Wiedeker, that that uh, made a big commitment to the team um, and a lot of resources to, to make it happen. Um, I thought Kip was supposed to be here, but I don't see him. But uh, he uh, he does a lot, you know, and, and he doesn't get any credit for what he's done. But he, uh, he's, he, he gets pushed to the limit with all that he does. And, you know, I get to just come up come out there, show up and play, do what I enjoy, and, and he really does all the legwork for us all, so um, really appreciate that. Um, also, like, just thank all the teammates I've had throughout the years. Um, have some here, Robert Harvey, and Ryan Ketman, Kyle Dalvitt, Kyle Jackson, um, obviously my brother, Tyler back there, now my coach, Slam. Um, and just all the all the other teammates I've had throughout the years, it's, it's I mean that's almost the best part of the basketball is uh, all the memories I have with those guys. So um, it's pretty cool to think back think back about that. Um, lastly, I want to thank uh, my little big brother Jared. Um, <laughs> I think. He's probably one of the biggest reasons um, for all the success I've had. Um, he uh, he's always helping me 
you know, growing up shooting and advice and all that. Um, and uh, but probably the biggest thing he instilled in me was was toughness. Um, he definitely wasn't easy on me. Um, <laughs> we had a lot of epic battles in our backyard, and uh, Robert and Mike, I'm sure, witnessed uh, a lot of these. But uh, they rarely, we rarely finished a game. Um, there was always a fight. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, there was times when I just hated him, just couldn't stand him. And then the next day, you know, obviously everything would be fine. But I mean, we would, we would battle, and uh, usually it ended with me crying, <laughs> my mom breaking up a fight. Sometimes <laughs> she got a little too close and my, maybe took a shot herself. <laughs> so she, was, uh, she was really a warrior that, in that aspect uh, for getting in there and saving me, really. Uh, I said Jared's not my little big brother, but he was always a lot bigger than me growing up. And especially, I think he was full grown in eighth grade. <laughs> I think I was probably... Five two and that was it. So, um, so I really uh, couldn't have asked for a better uh, role model and uh, friend to to pave the way for me. So appreciate that, Jared. Um, anyway, this has been a great honor, and uh, I just want to thank everybody for their support. And uh, thank you. Our third inductee is Jared Stevenson. When he graduated from Western in 2000, Jared held the men's basketball scoring career scoring record of 1,728 points. He led the Vikings in points three straight seasons and in assists twice. A second team West Region All-Star as a senior, Jared also was a two-time Pacific West Conference All-Star and a Pac West Academic All-Star. Jared played seven seasons professionally with the Bellingham Slam scoring 1,064 points and handing out 310 assists. He helped the team to two IBL titles. Prior to his college and professional careers, Jared was a standout player at Seom High School, playing on a Mariners team that went undefeated in 30 games and won the Class 3A state championship in 1996, the best season in school history. At state, Seahom won its tournament games by an average of 24.5 points. Jared has served as the assistant boys basketball coach at Ferndale High School for the last two seasons. Jared's presenter is Pat Fitter, as you've heard a couple of things already, but I'm still going to throw some things out there. Pat uh, was inducted into the Washington Interclassic uh, Basketball Coaches Association Hall of Fame in 2007, uh, recently stepped down after a 37-year coaching career. During that time, he won 728 games, the second highest total in state history, with a winning percentage of 75%. His teams won 18 league championships, 12 district titles, made 23 state tournament appearances, took home 15 state trophies, and won two state titles, the Class 1A title at Highland in 1988 and a Class 3A crown at Seahome in 1996. Pat is a, I gotta say it, be up front, he's a Central Washington graduate. <laughs> I know, and a member of that school's Hall of Fame. Uh, I think we should note that, wasn't it Jared that hit the three, uh, not a, uh, anyway, the women, game winning basket against Central, I think it went in one of our games at Carver. And uh, just wanted to point that out. Um, there, Pat was no, best known at Central as a football player. And I actually watched him play uh, back in the early 1970s. Pat Fitter. Shot, wasn't it against Central? I brought it for Jacob. 
Uh, you guys should fight over it. Here, Kyle. <laughs> I give it to Kyle because I can throw it that way, and Kyle can still go get it. So, <laughs> the, uh, uh, but I'm very honored to be here, and it's nice to uh, see all the people. I know uh, Jared and Jacob, when they were at side, it was fun because I remember chasing them around one night with the Harvey guys throwing eggs. They egged the whole place. I'm sure Halloween is not the same since those two boys have left the neighborhood. So it's pretty good. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we talk about all the numbers and different things that we have going on here. And the coaches they had, the Steve and Steve show with Steve Totten and Steve Miller did a great job. But Lou and Linda just did a tremendous job with these kids, you know. I'd probably still be at Sea Home if you would have had more sons. You know, <laughs> Julie was great, but you needed to have six, eight kids. We'd still be here, which would be pretty good. But I really enjoyed it, and actually with, it's such an honor to have the other players here. But one of the best things I remember about Jared, though, was uh, sophomore health class. And Ryan was in that class, too. And Jared was a very good student, and... Um, always on task. Well, I taught health in the classroom. They stuck me in the classroom a couple times. And with the health, we started out with the anatomy. And if you remember back to your health days, you had the anatomy, you had the male anatomy with all the branches that went out. This is a fallopian tube and this. And then you have the female on the other side. And so we went through the male anatomy. <laughs> we, we went through the male anatomy on one side, and then we did the female anatomy on the other side. And he said, be ready, because we're going to have a quiz tomorrow. And so we come out, and I give them the exact same sheet of the male anatomy on one side, female anatomy, but all the lines are blank. They have to fill them in. I said, okay, we're going to start with the male anatomy, fill in the blanks. I want no cheating. Keep your eyes on your paper. And so begin. And so immediately, everybody, you can just hear the pencils get everybody just silent. And I go, Jared Stevenson, stop cheating. And he looks and he goes, no, I wasn't. And I go, yes, you were. I saw you going like this. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway. So Jared, Jared actually was a lot of fun in the classroom and other things. And to tell you the truth, with Lou and Linda, as much as I have them, they were not real thrilled with me at several times at Seahawk, which is part of it. And the main one was, you know, we have these great two going to the Hall of Fame and everything else, but there was a year they could have played together at Seahawk High School, could have been on the same team. And we never discussed that, but they weren't thrilled about it. Now, I've never talked to him about this, but here is my rationale, okay? First off, Jared and Jacob, we needed a point guard because Jared was unmerciful on the person he was checking at practice. Josh Terrell was perfect because Josh could get beat up every single day for 60, 66 practices and be all right with it. And Jacob and him would have gotten a fight every single day, ruined practice, okay, <laughs> and we couldn't have had that. The other thing is, too, is in the, in the uh, drills, we need basically a point guard. And Jacob, who's a very good passer, uh, likes to shoot. Okay, so he's much more of a two guard, and it worked out pretty good. Plus, you got to admit, Jacob, you were a little bit of a doughboy that year, too, so <laughs> not picking on him. But. <laughs> and so, and so a rationale, but it worked out great because I think it was great. It was great for, and, and great for motivation. It worked out for Jacob and everything else, but. Uh, I want to explain myself in that situation because I knew that was a point of emphasis, but those kids were just so competitive. And the same way, I grew up with five brothers, so you realize, you know, you beat the heck out of each other, and if the garage doors close, you run your brother into the garage door so he makes sure he finishes his lamp and all the good things you learn <laughs> as a brother. The, uh, uh, but it was really nice because during that, that run at Sea Home, it was, it was so awesome because... This isn't just an honor for Jared and Jacob, but it's an honor for Ryan Ketman and Jeff Chapman and Keith Koskala and Pendry, who we had so much fun with. You know, Jess and just kept everybody loose and everything else. But it was just such a great honor for all those guys. And I still feel it's the greatest team because they were 30-0, you know, fifth in the nation, all the things that go with that. But it was the greatest team because if you look at the assist records now, they still hold all the assist records. And it's not about... You know, you could take the five best players. That Cleveland team had, what, five pros and so forth. Actually, they lost the game. But anyway, 
the uh, which happens a lot when you get five pros in the same team because they all want to shoot it. But the thing about the Seal team and the reason they got better and better is because of the passing. And I think uh, Steve, uh, or Jared uh, really started that. I mean, the rest of them became two. They all became good shooters. They all became good passers. But Jared's leadership on that was tremendous. And then Jacob turns out, it turned out great with that because then uh, uh, Jacob got to play together and got to receive a lot of those passes. Okay. And the toughness uh, as a brother, he had to just to survive. <laughs> just to survive that situation, he had to be tough. I'm sure. Jared wouldn't have killed you. I'm sure there's times he probably would have liked to. <laughs> and maybe crossed his nine, but he said, no, I still, you know, I'll just let him go here. But, but with that, that toughness is created. And then the nice thing about Jacob, it gave us that calmness on the floor. Then he had that calmness. No matter what situation, no matter how bad it was, things are tough. I remember playing Mark Morris at the state tournament uh, because that was the first year we went to the 4A Remember, because at first we were 2A and, you know, see homes too soft, it's an academic school, and blah, 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 you get that, and they couldn't do it, and then we placed the 3A. And to tell you the truth, Jared, if you and Keith wouldn't have run in each other in the middle of the floor against O'Day, we probably would have won that, but, you know, things yeah. happen. <laughs> but, anyway, <laughs> but the thing about it, and then the next year, then we go 3A. Well, now they're 3A, they won't be able to handle it. And then we won the 3A. And then with Jacob's year, then we go 4A. And we got third that year. So it didn't matter what level we were at, uh, that's where we're at. And to tell you the truth, part of it is the same way what I felt at Central. Because at Central, I thought too, because I know when I first came out of college, and the same thing with you, Jared, I know I was furious that we weren't going D1 with you. Okay? At first, it's kind of funny because at first, Jared, who do you think our fifth starter going to be? Because we got Keith and Jeff, and I go, it'll probably be Brady Gustafson, because Brady Gustafson's very good. And he goes, you know, Spink's real coming, coming along, Mark Spink is. And I go, well, yeah, but he's just not quite there yet. Well, obviously, that turned out well because Mark Spink wound up getting a full ride D1 to Gonzaga and got defensive player of his senior year. So he came along just fine. But Jared still likes him to give bad time because he goes, you think Brady's going to start ahead of Mark now? And I go, no, I don't think so. Because it worked out pretty good. But with that, then it comes now if, say, because I know I was really furious at Idaho because I wanted Idaho to give Jared a, a full ride scholarship. And I said, no, so forth. But then it turned out great because he's going in the Hall of Fame. I think if you had gone to a D1 school, probably would have gone in the Hall of Fame too, but it turned out great because now in the town of Bellingham, there's people we don't even know and there's people excited for you to be in the Hall of Fame. Because we talked about in high school, you'd be a class act because the little kids watch you, you want to be a class, because someday you're going to be out of high school and you want to get a job. And people are going to say, oh yeah, Jared Stevenson, oh yeah, Ryan Ketman, oh yeah, Kyle Jackson, I remember you, you're a class act in the floor, sure, I'd love to hire you. I want you part of it because you're a winner and you're a good person. And so that's why I think it's awesome. You know, I mean, you go in D2, you go in the Hall of Fame, uh, hometown, to be able to go with your brother is, is a tremendous opportunity. And it's great for your family, the Harveys, hanging out in the hood, you know, all those egg stains on the cars and houses. You paid their price because it helped you. Your accuracy was much better. Yeah. <laughs> but with that, but with that, I mean, uh, it was just such a pleasure for me to have the opportunity. And I think it's so great for the town of Bellingham. Uh, Coach Jackson, I know when I first was coming to Western, being a central guy, and my brother, George Bender, played for... D Nicholson when they got second. And he goes, you can go up there. He goes, but you better not become friends with Brad Jackson. I'll tell you. <laughs> and then I go back and I go, Brad Jackson's a great guy. And his language is Ellensburg style. But anyway, so what he said. <laughs> but anyway, and so uh, um, they say he's a great guy. And he, I mean, it's we got to take you to the first last chance tavern sometime because you'll realize, talk to him for five minutes how great a guy is. Because Brad and I gave great friends. And it was such an advantage for us at Seaholm to have Western. I know it's funny because we get calls from Western. Would you please keep your players out of our gym? You know, and Brad's turned around and said, yeah, Pat, keep them out of the gym. By the way, I gave those kids a locker so they could keep their ball in there. <laughs> so he wanted them in the gym also. And it was so exciting for me. I know sitting down at um, a uh, game when Simon Dubiel, who was their teammate, 
And then Ryan, Ryan, you checked him for a little while. And Jared, you checked him for a little while. And to see a former CEO mayor playing against each other, one from Central, one from uh, Western, and then taking turns playing each other was really exciting. And it was really fun to get that opportunity to see that. So I'm just excited for Jared because Jared has proven uh, to the town of Washington how exciting uh, life can be. I mean, he's a hometown guy. There's probably not a person, there's people you don't even know that are excited to be part of Jared Stevenson's life. And congratulations on being in the Hall of Fame. So this looks like the way up. Um, I came prepared to, uh, <laughs> just in case. That there. Don't um, my notes. <laughs> All right, yeah, no, the you're falls <laughs> um, Wow, this is, uh, been an awesome morning. Uh, seeing a lot of faces uh, that I haven't seen in a while. Uh, it's kind of odd following Jacob. I've got a lot of same things to say. Obviously, we had a similar uh, upbringing and, and, and everything. He just kind of followed me um, up. So uh, now I'm following him. Um, and, I, and I'll do the best I can uh, try not to uh, repeat what he said. Um, First of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Ron um, and Jen and Jacob. Uh, this is a tremendous honor. Um, and I, I would imagine they're as proud and excited as I am to join uh, this elite club. Um, kind of like Jacob said, you know, it's not something you think about. And uh, when I got a phone call from Paul about it, it was, it was just a surprise. Um, and, and again, I'm just excited. Uh, to, to be a part of this. Um, and then I'd also like to thank everybody for coming um, and supporting us this morning. Um, it, it's cool to see a, a full room and uh, see everyone here supporting us still um, after being out of school now for over a decade. So uh, that's neat. Um, this is a day I uh, will always remember and uh, something that I couldn't have accomplished without the help of many people. Um, uh, Steve Totten and Steve Miller are a couple of my uh, youth coaches that, that you've already heard their names, um, but, but they were a huge part of um, kind of getting us started and uh, teaching us the fundamentals of the game um, along with my dad. And uh, uh, I, re I really owe a lot to them, and I think we all do. Um, uh, they, they just did a tremendous job. Uh, Coach Jackson talked about the language uh, that we used to speak, <laughs> and that came directly from those coaches. So uh, that's, that's still fun. We get to uh, revisit that at the bars every once in a while. <laughs> uh, most people wouldn't understand it, so I won't talk like that. Um, I really appreciate Coach Fitter being here uh, today. He, he traveled over from... Uh, Ellensburg, Yakima. Um, so he uh, just made the special trip over here today uh, for me and, and for Jacob. And uh, that means a ton to me. So um, coach, thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, I had a fantastic experience at Seaholm. Um, really unmatched probably. Uh, being 30-0 and 0 and uh, I mean going back to my sophomore season, I, I, every, it was just a fun experience. Coach Fitters obviously uh, got a ton of jokes. I, I was not looking down my pants. <laughs> and I let you that clear. <laughs> uh, and, and if you've ever talked to him, you know, you know uh, what kind of personality he has, but he always made things fun. Uh, um, and uh, really the, uh, the things that he introduced me to, um, and, and, and our, our entire team um, on the mental side of sports uh, is probably the single biggest reason uh, why I've been successful and, and I think why the rest of us have been. Um, he, he taught us um, techniques on how to train our mind, um, how successful people think. Um, how to visualize uh, what we want to, excuse me, to accomplish. 
and uh, most importantly, just uh, setting goals and uh, doing everything that we needed to do to get those goals accomplished. Um, and without him, I, I really don't think I'd be standing up here. So, um, Coach, I really appreciate that again. Um, and, and I think he prepared me really well to come up here to Western um, and be successful up here. So, uh, thanks again, Coach. Um, Coach Jackson um, and, and Coach Dominguez gave me an opportunity uh, to come up here and uh, compete as a freshman, um, which not a lot of people get the opportunity to do. Um, and I would call myself ultra competitive. So when I got up here, the only thing I wanted to do was get an opportunity to play. And uh, coach, coach gave me that opportunity. And uh, uh, he he gets a lot. Of, he should get a lot of credit for that because I, I don't think there's a lot of coaches that would allow a freshman to come in uh, five year or five games into their career and and, and just let me go for it and start. Um, and that was that was a big deal. Um, and uh, I hope I I uh, proved you right, Coach, by being up here. So. Um, Coach uh, Jackson's door was always open. One of, the, one of the things I really appreciated about him while I was up here, I could go into the office and talk with him, just sit down and chat uh, whenever uh, I, I felt like it. You know, I, I spent a lot of time in the gym, spent a lot of time on campus studying, and uh, he, he was just always there if I needed to talk, if I wanted to talk strategy, if I just wanted to talk about life, whatever it was, he was always there. Um, and that was a big deal for me. Um, Couple things that still stick with me uh, to to this day, and, and they're kind of just things that Coach said to me multiple times, and uh, one of them was perception is reality, and uh, you know I, I still think about that uh, quite often, uh, just on at random occasions, you know, and and it's just something that I always relate back to Coach Jackson. Um, and uh, it's just something that really stuck with me and made sense. So uh, that's one thing. And then uh, Coach was always talking about the circle of control. Okay, and, and, and we can only control things that are in our circle. And then everything outside of that, we just kind of got to forget about. And, uh, and, and that's how you kind of move on and, and become successful. So um, Coach, I just really appreciated my time up here. and uh, and. and I just, I've just had a great experience um, pretty much throughout my basketball career, um, and that, that was just another, another piece of it. Um, Coach Tony uh, Dominguez just left here, but uh, he also had, I, I, I've got to talk about him because uh, putting the IBL together um, w was just another opportunity for me to get to play with Jacob and uh, continue to um, compete at a high level. Um, and, and it's just, it was just an awesome experience. Um, they retired me two years ago, so uh, I'm not playing anymore. But uh, I, I still have the opportunity to play in the uh, men's leagues with Jacob, um, Kyle Dalvin over there as well. And uh, it's probably not fair, but, but we have a good time. Uh, just getting back to Coach Jackson and Coach Fitter, um, the biggest thing about both those guys is if they, they've taught me things that kind of transcend basketball and things that I use in everyday life. And, uh, and, and that's the most important thing for me, um, just kind of taking those things. And, and uh, obviously, they're great role models and, and both great guys. Um, you heard Coach Fitters in multiple Hall of Fames. Coach Jackson, uh, I think, will be up here. At, when, when's the date when you can call them back up <laughs> next year <laughs> Maybe. yeah it's it's about time for him to come in I, I think and, and join the Hall of Fame uh, winning that uh, national championship was a was a really big deal uh, we had an opportunity Ryan and I to uh, sit there and watch the game on TV with another buddy of ours uh, AJ Gisa who played here and uh, it was just awesome to see um, and, and truly proud 
uh, to be a Viking at that time. So. Um, moving on to my teammates, um, I've, I've had just fantastic teammates, um, both at Seahome and, uh, and up here. Uh, Ryan Ketman uh, is uh, just, just a great friend of mine. Uh, he's here this morning. You've heard multiple uh, people talk about him. Uh, he was um, on the 30-0 on, 30 and 0 team with me um, at Seahome. Uh, we, we actually started playing together um, in fifth grade uh, and have basically played together ever since. Um, he's been my best friend, uh, my training partner. Um, and, he, and he's just always pushed me and uh, really deserves a lot of credit for me standing up here. Um, he's, he's just a winner and he's someone that I've uh, just always been able to count on. So uh, Ryan, appreciate it. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to mention to uh, both Jacob and Ryan, uh, watching you guys uh, in the, uh, make that run to the Final Four, uh, that was one of my greatest sports memories. Uh, and I just wish that I uh, could have been, <clears throat> excuse me, playing alongside you guys, because maybe we could have given Coach two national championships. <laughs> I'd like to think that anyways. I, I can say that now. <laughs> um, and then uh, Jacob uh, has obviously been a huge part of my uh, life. And uh, being his older brother, uh, I've just been extremely proud to watch him grow up and uh, follow in my footsteps and then kind of take it beyond uh, where I'm at. And he talked a little bit about um, our epic battles in the backyard. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I just I just have one memory that that sticks out, and like I said, we we go at it. Games rarely ended without a fight, and uh, I was beating him down pretty good one one day, and uh, he grabbed the ball, threw it at me, and he said, "Someday I'm gonna be better than you," <laughs> and. Uh, he was right. Um, <laughs> it took him a while, but he got there. And, uh, and, and I'm just really proud of what he's accomplished. Um, going into the Hall of Fame with him is, is really an awesome honor. So, um, excuse me real quick. Uh, My parents have made a lot of people cry tonight here, so uh, I, uh, I'm going to try to hold it together. Um, all of uh, everything that I am is because of them. Uh, I think I think Jacob would agree. Um, they're the most the people most responsible for our success. Um, excuse me. They are. Uh, the most selfless people I've ever met. Uh, sacrificing everything to make sure that we were successful. Um, they were our best coaches, teachers, and supporters. And uh, as was mentioned, uh, they never missed a game um, in, in the state or uh, many times traveling outside of the state to watch us play. Um, my mom says she's been to thousands of games, and uh, I have no doubt about that. Um, all the attributes that have led, uh, led to my success can be traced back to them. They're, they are the most competitive people I've ever met, and both extremely hard workers. Um, growing up, you don't understand uh, 
what they do for you. Um, but uh, looking back, it seems like the only thing that mattered to them was our success. And uh, that's obviously the reason I'm here and, and we're here. So uh, mom and dad, thank you very much. Um, and then just getting back to uh, being in the Hall of Fame here, when I received the uh, call from Paul um, about three weeks ago, telling me not, not only I was getting inducted into the Hall of Fame, but uh, so was Jacob. Um, I was kind of stunned. I, I, it, w it wasn't on my radar. I didn't know anything about the process or how it happens. Um, but uh, it's just been an awesome three weeks. I've been able to relive a lot of memories, um, looking back on my career here, um, and just all the awesome times that I had here at Western. Uh, I'm sure everybody in here understands how great of a university this is, what a great setting it is, what, what a great town Bellingham is. And, uh, you know, I, I've been fortunate to grow up here my whole life and, and be able to stay in this town and, and accomplish the things that I have here uh, at Seahome, at Western, everything else. So, again, um, I'm proud to be in this club, and uh, congratulations to all the rest of the nominees, and, and thank you. Our final inductee this afternoon is Jen Brandolini Register, who competed at Western from 1996 to 1999. We're going to divert here just a little bit. This has been a bittersweet time for Jen and uh, many others here today. While being happy and proud for Jen, we are also grieving over the death of her dear friend and teammate, Sonia Joseph Perez. She passed away on May 2nd after a courageous battle with breast cancer. Sonia was named the most valuable player at the 1998 NAIA National Tournament as the Vikings won the school's first, first, first national team title in any sport. The Vikings defeated Simon Fraser 5 to 1 in the title contest as they swept all five of their games in the 16-team double elimination tournament. Western trailed in four of those contests, winning two in its final at bat. In one of the biggest upsets in NEIA history, Sonia drove in the game-winning run with a two-out double in the seventh inning of a third round 4-3 victory over four-time defending national champion Oklahoma City. She also made four sparkling defensive plays in the title contest against Simon Frazier. Uh, we'd like to honor Sonia. Today also happens to be Western's American Cancer Society for Life Day. This marks the fourth year that Western has, um, athletes have participated, raising nearly $50,000 during that time. <clears throat> As in past years, Western Athletics again led the campus in money raised, and the top fundraising team was softball, which ran today uh, many in, in some in special t-shirts dedicated to Sonia's memory, displaying her jersey number two. The softball team, well, I'd like to point out the uh, many members of the 1998 championship team are, are right here at this table. Our softball team for this past year is seated in the back 
and head coach Amy Suter and assistant coach Jessica Ventosa are now going to present um, t-shirts to the four special guests that we have. We are very blessed to have here today. They are Sonia's husband, Michael, uh, daughter, Kaylani. I hope I get that right, Mike. <laughs> Mother, Kathleen Joseph, and Aunt Yvonne Johnson. They're all in the back, and we're presenting those t-shirts right now. <laughs> Jen Brandolini Register. Jen was named the Western Softball Player of the Century for 1900 to 99 helping the Vikings win the 1998 NEIA National Championship. She finished her four-year career holding and or sharing 25 school records. Jen was named to the NEIA National All-Tournament Team and the Pacific Northwest Athletic Conference Hitter of the Year in 1998. She hit from the left side for the first time that season. Uh, I don't know if you understand what a transition that would be to make. Leading the conference in batting, 431 hits, 69 runs scored, 44, and stolen bases, 30. A four-time conference all-star, Jen led the Western to the conference title as a freshman. Jen is completing her 11th year as a teacher at St. Lucie West Centennial High School, located in Port, Port St. Louis, Sport, Port St. Lucie, Florida. And I just thank her for and her family for um, coming up here today and making that trip. She has been the Eagles head softball coach the last two years after coaching volleyball for four seasons. Uh, a graduate of Bothell High School, she and her husband Ryan have a one-year-old daughter, Mackenzie, who's been pretty awesome today. <laughs> is she not this year? <laughs> um, Jen's presenter is the coach she had at Western, Art Finney. Art was named the NEIA National Coach of the Year in 1998. He won 186 games in seven seasons as Western's coach, directing the Vikings to four 30-plus win seasons. Art Finney. That wasn't fair, Paul, because I can get emotional on my own. I didn't need your help. <laughs> now I'm getting nervous, CJ, if you want to take one. <laughs> The last time I got to do this was for Kathy Johnson three years ago. And Paul told me that day, make sure you don't talk too long. <laughs> well, today, with physical limitations, I can only stand a certain length of time, so he doesn't have to worry about it. I'll be done. <laughs> this is a great day for Western Washington University women's softball. I say that because it's a great day for Jen Jennifer mm -hmm. Brandolini. And Jennifer, known best to her teammates and coaches as Brando, is an important and irreplaceable part of the history of Western Washington University women's softball. I first met Brando when I was coaching the Rising Stars, ASA 16-under girls select fast pitch team, and Brando joined the team. The first thing I noticed about Brando was her speed. The second thing was her passion. I think it's fair to say that people noticed those two things her entire playing career. And I'm pretty sure they still notice her passion because that's the way she lives her life. When I accepted the position of head coach at Western Washington University, I began my tenure at the beginning of a school year in September. Late enough, there was no opportunity to recruit for my first season. So I did the next best thing and began immediately recruiting for the following season, starting with Jen Brandolini. I felt hands down Brando was a Division I caliber player, and I wanted to get her committed before anyone else could. Plus, I knew what I was getting with Bob and Maxine. They would support the entire team, not just their daughter, and they would shoot straight with me. Believe me, they were always honest with me, <laughs> and I appreciated it. Brando became the first player I signed in my first recruiting class. Special place at Western, and that is safe to say a very, very good signing and a very good class of players. As a freshman, Brando made a big splash as a leadoff hitter with a 308 average, three home runs, and was successful on 18 of 23 stolen base attempts. She was a threat to make something unexpected and special happen every time she was on base, 
and patrolled center field as though the world might come to a hint, an end if a base hit fell in her territory. Very good season, but I knew she was capable of so much more. I'm going to back up for just a moment and mention something at the time Jen wasn't crazy about. When I coached her on the Rising Stars 16 and under and 18 under teams, every year I would suggest to her that I turn her around and have her hit left-handed so we could fully use, uh, utilize her exceptional speed, a weapon no one would really be able to defend. The game plan would be first teach her to bunt and slap and then eventually hit away. I tried unsuccessfully to sell her on the idea and convince her she would still hit for some power because she was just naturally strong. She was not interested. In the small world category on that 18 and under team, there was a 13-year-old, a little, little Amy Hansen, <laughs> who played outfield and started as a 13-year-old on that team, and she is now Amy Souter. Back to the end of her freshman year, during the exit meetings at the end of the season, once again I suggested to Jen that maybe she wanted to consider being a left-handed hitter. It wasn't too late. She would be on base much more often, utilizing her speed to cause opponents to make a lot of mistakes, a lot more opportunities to steal bases, score runs. I pointed out her strikeout total was a little too high. Her on-base percentage was just a smidget too low. But again, she was not convinced. She was determined to stay with what she was doing and improve at it. I think I may have forgot to mention Brando's a little bit strong-willed, too. <laughs> Although Jen was still a good player her sophomore year and an incredible base runner and center fielder, her batting average dipped a little bit and her strikeouts were again a little too high. But she was successful 20 of 23 stolen base attempts and wreaked havoc on the bases, proving what type of threat she really could be. And again, she was the best center fielder in the league. One last time, I used the exit meetings as an opportunity to suggest she become left-handed. This time, though, I kind of had to mention something about I couldn't have a leadoff hitter with that batting average and those strikeout totals. And she could be a left-handed batter, and I could commit to her as the leadoff batter. Or maybe she could stay right-handed, and I could drop her a few spots in the batting order. <laughs> I didn't say it quite like that, but I'm pretty sure that's the way she understood it. So this time she decided it was the perfect time <laughs> to switch to the opposite batter's box. What a great decision she made. I firmly believe that decision earned her the recognition she is receiving today because she set herself up for two of the best back-to-back -back seasons a player could ever have in all facets of the game. The learning curve was quick as assistant coach Ed Eliason and I spent time with Brandel, alternating pitching to her and instructing her in the fundamentals of the left hand short game. She was so determined. I will never forget how determined Jen was. Rarely is an athlete able to will themselves to be successful. Brando could and did. By the beginning of the regular season, we were ready to unleash our new devastating leadoff weapon on our opponents. And Brando made sure to give those opponents way more than they could handle or had ever imagined they would see. Because they had to deal with a third year player who was an upper echelon blue chip athlete and they had no scouting report on her. A teammate came over to where assistant head coach Dick Green and I were standing and told us that CJ and Brando were upset with each other. <laughs> Now these are our team captains. <laughs> My first thought wasn't a particularly pleasant one for, we'll skip that one. My next thought was this may not be the worst thing. Our leadoff hitter and our cleanup hitter are getting testy and that means they're ready to compete. Their intensity and passion levels are high. They're gonna take that out on someone. Of course, my next thought was I hoped it wasn't each other. <laughs> but I think the result of the tournament indicates who took the brunt of the pain. Many players have to contribute to win a national championship. We know about CJ and Brando and there were many others. 
There was solid infield play, solid outfield play, timely hitting, two tough pitchers. And Brando's best friend and tournament most valuable player, Sonia Joseph, who none of us will ever, ever forget. But when the potential final out of the seventh inning of the championship game was a high fly ball to center field to Brando, the best center fielder in the nation, I immediately hit speed dial on my cell phone to call home before the ball ever came down to rest in Brando's glove. I screamed into my phone, we just won nationals. Because <laughs> I knew there was no way, not in a million years, that Jim Brandolini would not catch that ball. Not Brando the competitor, not Brando the winner. When the All-American Awards were announced, following the tournament, Brando was disappointed to see players with much lower stats than hers, and obviously their team didn't win the tournament, who were selected All-American. She was not. Brando had hit 431, stole 30 bases, played flawless center field. No one could legitimately say she wasn't a catalyst and a leader. I was as upset and disappointed as she was because it was obvious she deserved it and was snubbed because she was just some player up in the corner of Washington State. Voters rarely saw, if ever. That always affected our rankings, and this time it was affecting player recognition. All I could say to her was, Brando, it's better to have earned the award and recognition and not received it than to have received it and not earned it. That may not mean much today, but I hope someday it will. Brando, I hope today is the day it does. I'm saddened that Dick Green passed away April 19, 2013, cannot see today happen. Bunky, as the team affectionately called him, was a huge Brando fan. Many times reminded me exactly how big a fan he was and how important she was, as if I didn't realize it. His wife, Wanda, told me last night to tell you congratulations on behalf of her and Bunky and tell you how proud Bunky would be. And we are all extremely saddened by the recent passing of Brando's best friend and our eternal teammate. The player who played alongside her in the outfield, batted second, one spot behind her in the batting order. Sonia Joseph, who in the semifinal game hit an opposite field double to plate Brando with a winning run, a defeat four-time repeating national champion Oklahoma City. Sonia, the MVP. Complimented Brando's game and Brando complimented Sojo's game, as well as any one, two hitters and left and center fielders possibly could. But today is your day, Brando. You so deserve it. We try to use words to describe you, your skills, your accomplishments, but words are not nearly enough. Thing is, we want everyone to appreciate the way you played the game appreciate you, but they didn't have the honor of watching you play like we did. So how can they? That's like telling me to fully appreciate Babe Ruth or Ty Cobb or any of the greats of the game when I couldn't see them play. <coughs> the least we can do is try to take me, make people understand a fraction and remind you a fraction how we feel about you. Bunky, who scouted for the California Angels, often talked about scouting five-tool player. That is running speed, arm strength, hitting for average, hitting for power and fielding. He always said you were a five-tool athlete. For once, I think Bunky was wrong. You were a six-tool athlete. Supposedly, they don't exist. Some scouts and coaches refer to drive, competitive instinct, passion, and leadership as intangibles because it's so difficult to assess a value. You use drive, competitive instinct, passion, and leadership as a tool, not an intangible. Everyone who saw you play can assess that value. The value is champion. We love you, Brando. You deserved and received your recognition. And you, my friend, are a Hall of Famer. Thank you, Art. Um, 
you'll never know how much your words mean to me and um, I, I really appreciate you being here. I know how hard it was for you to get here. So um, thank you. I um, had to write my speech um, and I probably will read it word for word because if I don't, this will not end well um, <laughs> for anybody. I just want to first off say what an honor and a blessing it is to be here and to be asked um, to be a part of this group of people. Um, I get to join uh, so many great athletes, um, Jacob and Jared, like we went to school together and now we're here together. It's, it's awesome, Ron. You know, another great part of history at Western. Um, but more importantly, I, I'm very, very honored to join my good friend and teammate, Kathy Johnson Evans, um, as the first softball inductee um, into the Hall of Fame. And I, I'm standing right alongside of her, which I, um, is amazing. Thank you for allowing me to be next. <laughs> See, I, I went off script, and this is what happens. <laughs> Um, thank you, Western, um, for granting me this incredible award. Um, I found writing this speech, again, very difficult, and not because I couldn't find the words. For those who know me know I don't struggle in that area. <laughs> but because I have a lot of words, I have too many words, so many great memories, and a lot of great people to thank. Um, today is, as um, I, Paul said, is a very bittersweet moment to me because I know something and someone is missing. And um, I am so honored that Sonia's family could be here today. To, I know that she wanted to be here, and so seeing you out there is, it means the world to me. So thank you. Um, playing on this team has been... Hold on a second. <laughs> Playing on this team and being a part of this program has been one of the biggest um, cornerstones of making me who I am today. I have so many great memories um, playing and, and with my teammates, and I, I kind of want to share a few with you. Um, I, I'd like to start out, and we've kind of shared a lot of memories over the past couple days. And so to some of you, this is going to be a repeat. Um, but our morning workouts, I will never forget those. 5.30 a.m., my alarm would go off, and um, Lou Parberry was nobody's best friend, <laughs> except for uh, maybe CJ and JT at the end. It wasn't in the beginning. Um, everyone would trickle in with sleep in their eyes, and you figured out really quickly who you could talk to and who you couldn't for the first 45 minutes. Um, we learned a lot in that gym. Um, we got stronger as individuals, um, but more importantly, so much stronger as a team. Um, those morning workouts were much more than building muscles, but it was about building relationships and getting to know each other as well as we knew ourselves. It took me about 10 years to get any other, uh, any type of jeans to fit just right after working out for four years straight. Um, but I wouldn't give back any of those um, mornings for extra sleep, not in a million years. Um, another big aspect, and I think a, a big reason why uh, we went on to win the national championship game was in 1998, well, 1997, fall of, we, we got a new coach. Um, Ian Shoemaker, he was uh, a student coach and he was big on sports psychology. And uh, I just remember one day being taken into a classroom and lights were turned off and make yourselves comfortable, lay on the floor if you have to. Uh, we're going to play some music, Enya, I think it was. Um, I'm like, what are we doing? What, what is going on here? We were learning how to visualize. Um, 
We were given rubber bands to snap when we made errors. I, it was a little all crazy. Um, come to find out, this was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, and I, I use it. I don't use the rubber band anymore, but I do visualize quite a bit in my life and, and, and dream of things that I want, and a lot of, a lot of them have come true. Um, we would go on to win nationals that year, and I really believe our mental game had a lot to do with it. Over the last several weeks, I've spoken to a few uh, different people, um, teammates, friends, family, um, reporter, a couple of people called from Bellingham Herald and they asked, um, what was it like to win a national championship? And to put it sim simply, it was a dream, dream come true. Um, nobody, and I said this this morning to the current team, I was like, nobody goes to college and doesn't dream of winning a national championship. It's, it's, it's what you do. Only a few teams ever get to experience that and we did it and we're so very lucky two major moments stand out from that tournament and um, one you've heard a couple different times I'll touch on that briefly but the first one I will never forget driving to the field the very first we headed to the field for the very first time we're in our vans and um, our stops at the stoplight we're gonna make a left if I remember correctly on the field on the street that the field was on and um, he just stops the light turns green he's not going uh, he's just staring yeah. come to find out the name of this street was called Western Washington Street I don't know what more of a sign you can get <laughs> to tell us that the 16th seed into this tournament was meant to be there. Uh, about six or seven years later, my uncle, um, who lives in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, where we played, sent me a package for Christmas. Um, it was an odd-shaped package, not quite sure. Why would my Uncle Denny be sending me a Christmas gift? It's odd, he didn't draw my, draw my name this year. Um, he managed to get me one of uh, the street signs I swear no laws were broken. <laughs> he uh, had a friend who worked for the city and they were replacing all the signs and he's like, please just let me have one of those signs. And that, that um, street sign is a constant reminder. I look at it every day, it's in my classroom. And I, um, it just is a constant reminder of our battle and our victory, that, that tournament. And I'm, you know, what an amazing sign it was. <laughs> Of all the games we played, and you've heard it a couple times, it wasn't the last game that stands out. I mean, we played Simon Fraser for the last game, and that was like the umpteenth time we played them all season long. It was kind of an odd ending, I, but we won, so I guess it was great too. <laughs> but it was the third game that we've talked about against Oklahoma City, and um, it was that was the type of ending you only see in movies. You know, you have... The bottom of the seventh, two outs, games tied three to three. I'm at the plate. I slap the ball, and like Art says, I got on because of an error. It, 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 I made them work hard for that, and they bobbled the ball, and I got on, thankfully. And then Sonia got up to the plate, and I you know, can't remember if it was the first, the second, or the third um, pitch that came across. I just knew the moment she made contact, I was off. And I remember rounding second, and I see Bunky, you know, he was waving me on, and, and we won. And it was at that moment we knew that this was our, our tournament. This was ours to have. I thought for many years that winning the national championship was the highlight of my college days until recently. Um, I realized the highlight was the people and the, the teammates that I met, that I got to know and play with. Um, we went through a lot of trials and tribulations, a lot, and I didn't think that national mo that <laughs> fight we had would ever get brought up. I tried never to mention it. Shame on you. <laughs> but we have, um, 
the connections we've made, the long-lasting connections that we've made, no one will ever be able to take away. It is um, not lost on me that while this is an individual achievement, many people played a part on making me the person and the athlete I was. At, and at this time, I would like to thank those people. Um, I've always been a Christian, but I think the last several years, I it has um, I have just become more connected with um, God, and I, I, I want to thank him for giving me the talent and the determination, and I know that through him all things are possible, so thank you. Um, to my husband, Ryan, and my daughter, Mackenzie, she's the loud one over there. I, I don't know where she gets it from. Um, you didn't know me back then, but I know if you did, you would have been my biggest fans, and I love you, and I thank you for sharing this special time with me. To my parents, um, Bob and Maxine and my brother, Tony, they have been with me every step of the way. Um, you know, they've been my biggest supporters through good times and bad. They were there to encourage me, motivate me, console me, and to tell me to suck it up when I needed it most. And I love you and I thank you for being there. To my extended family and my close friends, thank you for being my support. I'm sorry, baby. <laughs> Today is one of the many examples of your unwavering support for me. And I, I thank you for being here. Who brought that kid? <laughs> <laughs> me. Okay. To my coaches, um, Art, Ed, Ian, and Bunky, I thank you for putting up with me. I know it wasn't easy. Um, your patience and willingness to give me and our team 110% every day, all year long. You were the glue that held this team together. And you taught me a lot about softball and about life on and off the field, and I could never thank you enough. Thank you. To my teammates, every single one of you, some who can't be here, you will never know how deep my, appreci my appreciation runs for each of you. The countless hours we spent training, practicing, and playing, your words of encouragement, and of course your ability to push me to limits that I never knew existed. That competitive side of me came out because you you made it come out of me, and you know uh, some people didn't like that, you know, and I struggled with that, but I I um I don't I don't regret it. I think for me it's like I want you to know that everything I did was just to make a team better, you know. So. If I came off, I don't know. You use the words in your head. I, I'll keep them right here. No. You know. Winning that national championship was every single one of us. And um, I wouldn't have wanted to do it with anybody else. And Sonia, I know you're listening. She was my partner and my girl and my rock. And I thank you for being the best teammate and a friend I could ever ask for. I love you. To the current team, I want to thank you for being here. Um, gosh, just having you here is amazing. Um, I just want to tell you to never stop learning. There's always something to learn, even your junior year. <laughs> never give up and most importantly those teammates you share the field with you get to know them and love them make them look good and they will make you look good and celebrate each other's successes and victories and I wish you the best of luck I thank you again for this amazing honor and today is something that I will remember and cherish forever and my husband uh, 
you know, after we got the phone call from Paul, and, you know, he's like, I don't know if you can make it. You live in Florida. I'm like, are you kidding me? He goes, well, ask your husband first. I'm like, he really doesn't have a choice in the matter, so. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I'll call you back in a second. Um, he said, it's been a great uh, year for the Register household. You know, my husband's a big FSU fan, so Knowles won the national championship. Seahawks won the world championship. That's right. <laughs> and then I get inducted into the Hall of Fame, and I, I couldn't be more proud, and I thank you guys. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time, our uh, 2014 inductees, Ron Radliff, Jacob and Jared Stevenson, and Jen Brandolini, registered.